very much for joining us today for the uh, reinstallation celebration for Wolf 42. I'm George Buman. I have the honor of getting to sculpt Wolf 42, but like a lot of you, um, you had the pleasure of knowing her. And it's, it's, it's an interesting thing when so much of what you experience over years and even decades is very ephemeral. If it wasn't for the, the research that Doug has been putting together and Katie and their books, um, Jim, the genealogy work, and the, the wolf charts, uh, Bob Landis with his film work, um, a lot of this would just disappear like the snowflakes that come in and out of the valley here. The stories, Rick McIntyre's recent books, telling those stories as so many of us experience them, has a way of taking something that's pretty ephemeral, pretty point specific in time, and leaving it for future generations to really enjoy. So for today, we have a few of these esteemed folks with us to share some of their personal stories and memories of the reintroduction, Wolf 42, the Druids. Um, they include Doug Smith, Rick McIntyre, um, Jim Halfpenny, and Bob Landis. And um, I'll share with you the story that inspired the sculpture. As some of you know, the sculpture was here a few years back. And it was taken off display and wasn't going to go back on display for any foreseeable amount of time. So I sent it on a field trip to Colorado to a gallery, and it found a permanent home. <laughs> and other folks said, well, is it going to come back? <laughs> and the answer was, I don't know. But uh, we did find some folks who are willing to support that. Um, the 06 Legacy, um, the Lane family, as well as Peter and Alicia Pond helped bring the sculpture back to the headquarters here in the bookstore. So thank you to them. If you know any of them, run into them, please acknowledge and thank them for doing that. But at this point, I actually want to start right off and just tell 42's story from, from those who knew it best. So Doug, would you be willing to share a few thoughts from your time here? OK, thanks, George. Um, I won't be long, because my um, remembrances of 42 are a lot of her inside pen, um, going up there frequently to feed her. She probably didn't like that uh, time together. Um, she was the second group. She was uh, Rose Creek Penn, but because we named a pack the year before after Rose Creek, which flows right by the pen, uh, Drew and Pete kind of overlooks the uh, pen there, so we named that pack Drew and Pete. Um, it brings back many memories for me. Mike Phillips was a, ver a very, he was here the first two years, very important, the original project leader. He and I were working together at that time, and so it brings back great memories of that. 42 went on to be, I think, one of, uh, and, you know, if Rick's going to talk, I shouldn't say much. Others in the room knew her as well. Um, Bob, uh, obviously, with the films. But, you know, she was one of the first superstar wolves, easily recognizable. Um, I think what lit her up the most was, you know, a true wolf love story, 21. That's a sad story. 31, 38 got killed when they left the park. That's a story that repeated itself to the east a few times. But uh, 21 filled in the void. We all know what happened after that. Probably, the, in a lot of ways, you could say the first couple of Yellowstone, although 9 and 10 would make a run at that as well, 7 and 2. But you know we could all discuss that. Uh, these are easy to remember <laughs> numbers. Two back in the single digit days, or just two digits. We're up in the you know 1200s now. It's harder to keep track of them all. But anyways, uh, you know one. I'll just finish by saying the interesting thing about wolves, and I'm speaking in a, in a, to a crowd who knows all this. They're all individuals. They all have their own personalities, and that is what I think makes Yellowstone wolf watching and Yellowstone Wolf research, both, you know, uh, citizen science and science go together. Uh, that comes out especially in wolves like her. And what really makes Yellowstone special is you can get to know them because she was out in Lamar Valley almost every day. So anyways, that's all I have to say. Thanks for the chance to speak to you. <laughs> and I think Doug is probably enjoying being out of that limelight and in retirement, or, or not really. <laughs> but uh, thanks for those kind words. Um, now, next up, we'll have Rick McIntyre speak. And yet, as Doug was saying, that, that personal, personal from our end ability 
to get to know an individual from another species is just unparalleled here in the park. And you know, for years, many of us out there on the roads and in the watching scene knew these stories and these individuals, but with the changing of folks and time, those, those connections started to slip. And so I'm really glad to see that Rick's work in, in his years and now decades of time out there have brought that around into a way that, that more people can experience it, at least learn what's possible when you sit in place in a special location like Lamar and Yellowstone's Northern Range and see those individual stories unfold. So Rick, would you, would you share with us? Well, thank you, George. Um, thank you, Bob, for setting this up. Hi, Doug. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because uh, some of you know we've, we've sold the uh, stories in the wolf books to the movie people, and one of the screenwriters, a guy that's written some of the, the Marvel superhero movies, he, he asked me a question. He said, well, when you were being supervised by Doug Smith and you went into his office, w would you call him sir? <laughs> How many times did I ever call you, sir? Never. Really. Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, sir, this is always the first time. <laughs> uh, so right now, 42 is very much going to be a, a, a major heroine in the Hollywood movie. It will be a, a CGI version of 42, so it's going to take a few years for all that to come to fruition, but that's on its way. Um, some of you know that in my book on 21 and 42, I mentioned that George's statue of 42 was in the lobby of, of this building, and then as George said, there was a point where it was taken away, so for quite a few years, uh, George and I have tried to figure out a way to get her back, and so we're really pleased to do that. And um, Bob has, is it okay if I say? I don't know what you're going to say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Bob has known me for, what, 50 years, so he, yeah, he has to be cautious. Um, we're um, hoping that we might be able to work out a situation where we can borrow uh, Bob's statue of 21 and put him beside 42. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? <laughs> it's called a temporary loan. Put okay. the word permanent. Uh -huh. um, the deer and the elk in my yard uh -huh. has to see 21. Uh -huh. There's so much to say, um, there's so many stories about 42. Um, she had a tough life, and that was mainly because of her sister, 40. They were exact opposites, one was blonde, the other was, I guess you could say, brunette. And um, one was a psychopath. <laughs> uh, are there any women here that have difficult sisters? <laughs> what's, what's wrong with your sister? <laughs> I'd rather not say. <laughs> okay. Is she here right now? No. Oh, okay. Uh, meaning like she's I, I don't dead. want anyone to think that I'm related to her. Oh, okay. Okay. In, in, that, in the capacity where I think she's kind of Okay. I do a lot of talks for kids, and I'll ask that question, and boy, all the girls want to tell about their sisters. <laughs> it's like, she steals my clothes, she tattles on me, and so I've been learning a lot about sisters. But I think, um, to limit myself to just one story of 42, um, there's so many, it, it really does have to be her relationship with 40. Um, we had pretty good evidence that in the Denning seasons of 98 and 99, um, we knew that none of 42's pups survived those two years, and there was evidence that 40 had visited her den site and very likely killed her pups, uh, which is the, the worst thing that a member of Wolfpack could do to a, a fellow member. Um, 
I, I called 40 a psychopath, and that's probably a pretty realistic um, um, description of her character. She drove her own mother out of the pack. She drove, uh, there were triplet sisters. She drove uh, the third sister, well, 41, and then turned her aggression against 42. And then everything came to a head in the spring of 2000. That year, 40 commandeered the main den site in the Druid Den Forest across from the Hitching Post lot. And then 42 made a new den on the south side of the road, somewhat across from the Institute. There were, I think, three other younger females that had pups that year. And um, by that time, 42 had built an alliance with those younger three females. And we think either one or two of them were denning with um, 42 to the south of the Institute. And uh, one day, we were out in the park one morning, and we saw 42, after her pups had been born, leave her den, walk the several miles to um, the area south of the Institute, and then she walked into the thick forest, went uphill, meaning she was going directly to her sister's den. And it sure looked to us that now for a third time, her intent was to kill 42's pups. Um, it was the end of the day, and it was getting dark. Uh, we just couldn't see what was going on, partly due to the trees, partly due to the darkness. So we just had to go home. I got out there real early. Both of them had working collars, and I got both signals. And just before, well, even before I could start to get my spotting scope out, a woman uh, ran at me, and she was pretty close to being hysterical, and she said, I was in uniform at the time, Ranger, you gotta do something, there's a, a suffering wolf over here. And so she took me over to a culvert, and lying in the water was a wolf that was just drenched in blood, and, and was shivering because of the, the cold weather in the water. And there was so much blood that I, I misidentified it as 42, thinking that this is it, this is her sister's revenge, this is the end of the life of 42. But then we realized that, no, it wasn't 42, it was 40. And she was still alive. It was a very difficult situation because by then there was a huge crowd and everyone was very emotional and understandably about the situation. By that time, uh, Mike Ross came on the scene. Um, several other rangers were there. There was a lot of pressure on us to, to do something about this. So Mike suggested that we pick up 40. Uh, we put her in the back seat of a um, um, king cab type pickup. We drove over to the, the institute and we were still trying to figure out what to do. Um, Mike went into the, uh, to use the phone, and for a while we were thinking, should we try to take it to her vet? Um, I, I guess I didn't say that initially there was some, some speculation it, it was done by a person like a car, uh, but no, it was really wolf bites. But in the end it didn't matter because um, before Mike could even finish her call, his call, um, 40 stopped breathing. And that was the end. And um, we still had a crisis on our hand because um, 40's pups were not being nourished. So the next day we saw 21 leave the main den across from the hitching post. He walked the, the several miles to 42's den. We saw him go up into the trees and then come down with 42, brought him over to the main den. And uh, we still were trying to figure out what's going to happen here. Is she going to kill her sister's pups in retaliation to what Forty had done to her? She was in the trees. We couldn't see what was happening for an hour or two. And then she made a beeline back to her den site. And over the, the rest of the day, one by one, in her mouth, she carried all of her pups to the main den. The other females that were denning there did the same thing. 106, who was denning over by uh, Trout Lake, brought her pups there. So in theory, um, in addition to 40's litter, there were litters from four other females. But what was going to be the fate of 
40s pubs. We watched the den forest day after day for the next few weeks, but because the trees were so thick, we just really couldn't see what was going on. And then finally, one day, I think we were up on Dead Puppy Hill, um, we could see 40 coming into a, an opening from the trees, a meadow, and behind her were the other mother wolves kind of watching in single file, and right behind the last mother, the pup started to come out, and it was this single file thing all across the meadow, maybe the size of this room. And by the time they all had crossed through, we had a count of pups of 21, 21 pups. And that was a pretty good indication that they were raising 40s pups. And at the end of that year, 2000, 20 of the 21 pups had survived, which was a, just an unbelievable survival rate considering what, the, what had been done to them. And to finish up, I think I'll just mention one more wolf, one of the pups that was born that year, grew up to be a, a somewhat famous alpha female, that was 472, who was the um, longtime alpha female of the Aga Creek den. And probably for all of us in biology classes in high school and in college, there's that, that thing that the professors always talk about, is it nature or nurture? Do we turn out the way that we are because of our genetics, our nature, or the way that we were nurtured growing up. So we, we knew from genetic analysis that 472 had been born to 40, but it had been raised by 42. So as I watched her career as she grew up and ran her pack, boy, I'd have to say that her character, her nature, her personality was a very, very close match to not her mother, but to 42. And then uh, many of you are aware that 472 eventually was the mother of the famous 06 female, so uh, we never would have had the 06 female if it wasn't for 40 saving those pups. So, I mean 42 saving those pups. So that's my 42 story. Thank you. And what Rick didn't tell you is that the um, the screen adaptation will include theatrical portrayals of both he and Doug. Have they uh, let on who, who will be playing you? They're, they don't allow me to say. George Clooney or Brad Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> they, they need someone better looking, I think. Okay, well, they'll try, I'm sure. That's what casting's job is for. <laughs> At this point, I want to introduce Jim Halfpenny. For, for many of you, uh, the wolf scene is inextricably linked to the wolf charts. Um, back from the beginning, uh, Jim put those together as a way for the public to really start keeping track of these individual wolves, follow their stories. Um, through his tracking work, many of you probably have those bronze castings of Wolf 42 or 40 or 42's track and 21's track. Um, the life-size version of Wolf 21, incidentally, that, that um, uh, Rick and, and Bob were talking about has his foot somewhat elevated and I took Jim's track and cut off the foot pads in clay of the sculpture I'd made and pushed them into the track. Mm -hmm. So if you ever see that life-size sculpture um, when it's on loan, <laughs> 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 temporarily, <laughs> look at the feet, the one foot, the one hind foot that is up and that's actually 21's foot pads mm -hmm. in his track. So, um, but Jim has taken that on further. Um, Leo has been involved with the, the genetics project to kind of tell the, the genealogy of the Yellowstone wolves as a way to deepen and appreciate the family tree that's come out of not only 42, but, but all of these uh, early founders. So Jim, you wanna Thank take you. it from here? Well, George wanted me to tell him ahead of time what he would say <laughs> that I was gonna talk about. I told him all the genealogy stuff. But think about it for half a second here, folks. We're here today because of an incredible lady, philoanthropomorphic, number 42. But we're also here because, in fact, we got sculptures of 42, right? So let's tell a uh, George Buman story <laughs> about the sculpture. I wasn't he part of the plan. This was coming. <laughs> Did you ever wonder why she has ears? You probably should have. Nobody did. Okay, well, back before the days of the George Buman studio, which is high up the road now, 
Uh, we didn't have anywhere to work in such things, so we opened up the track museum downstairs, and George worked there for at least nine months or so, first putting together 21 as a statue, and then 42. And 42 stands, if you look, a little bit more vertical, and has ears. Mm -hmm. Well, the day comes, she was done. Now, if you've never seen an artist's work on a stage, there's the stage that stood up about this tall so George didn't have to be down on his knees all the time. There's lead plumbing pipes coming up into this statue. There's a frame all around it, wood and metal. And then there's clay all over that frame and it's heavy. Well, the day come, she was done. We had to get her out for George so that we could, uh, that George could get her to the foundry and have the bonds made. Now, if you look at the center, you'll see there's a regular garage door, garage-sized door there that goes up and back. And there were, oh, George and maybe five of the others, about six of us there. And we started trying to bring her out. Too damn big to come out the door. <laughs> With all of our muscle and everybody involved, we knew she wouldn't go this way, so we started trying to turn her this way and bring her diagonally through the door. No way. Ears were too long. <laughs> George walks up, out comes the knife, and whoop with ears. My stomach did flip-flop. Crush. <laughs> well, we got her out. George brings the ears back over and puts them on. And, uh, sorry, George. <laughs> yeah, George put them on. Brought them back over, put them on again. And so the statue you get to say today has ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, we decided we ought to, George says, let's take a little look at some stuff people may not be in on, on the genealogy and what's going on. So we sit down and start looking. Now many of you, as George mentioned, are aware of the chart here. And the purpose of the chart originally is this bottom line, provide funding for the wolf project through the foundation. And we're up somewhere 70 to 80,000 charts that have been sold now. And how many people have taken their chart and address donations, I don't know there. But we sat down and started putting it into Ancestry.com. Now that's a story in and of itself. I called Ancestry and I said, hey, can I put a big um, family tree in there? It's got about 1,300 members. They said, oh yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> I said, well, it's wolves. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> the first of half a dozen phone calls, but we got permission to do it. But the problem is, ancestry was made for people, not wolf people. We're wolf people. We understand wolves, not people. So we sit down and we diligently start to enter the data. This is wolf so-and-so, and she has six babies. Bang! Comes a red warning. You don't need that. She's two years old. <laughs> And she has six babies? <laughs> and you're trying to give her a three-year-old husband? <laughs> well, this, this was a process to get this all done and workarounds and stuff like that. But we started looking at, all of you are familiar with the tree. It starts here, comes over in branches, comes over in branches, comes over in branches. Well, Ancestry just started a new thing, uh, came from the Mormon work of about 15 years ago, called a fan tree. So I'm going to pass fan trees around. And Leo was looking for a fan that um, showed most of the uh, spots full. And so we chose, he chose on that 907. Go ahead and pass it around. And we said, well, today's going to be about 2 o's, or about 42. So here's 42. But there's a lot of white in it, isn't there? Because she came directly from the Canadian Limage. So we'll pass these around also. So we started working on it. And the question is, if you go out there and look at all the wolves today, all the wolves that are past, and so on, how many of those wolves have 42 DNA? Well, that's all in Ancestry. Should be easy to get. So I go to Ancestry and I start plugging it in there. And I don't see how to get it. I don't see how to get it. I don't see how to get it. Oh, let me uh, mention Leo is sort of the caretaker of Ancestry.com and makes a lot of the background stuff going on. Oh, Leah, did you bring anything to that? I did, in fact. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, we might want to share. 
crap one end of that, Jim. You need another Vanna. <laughs> now it's only about 10 generations top to bottom, but when you start looking lengthwise, it gets a little bigger. Now, George, I need you for a moment here, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to select the wolf, and... Uh, Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> There's no way in the world I can read that. It's so small. This thing's 12 foot long, and the wolves on there still have to be so small we can't read it. So how many wolves have our DNA? That information is hidden in Ancestry.com, and we still don't know. But. I have a fellow who made a, we know how to go in there one at a time and get it. And I have a fellow that made a foolish promise to me. <laughs> he said he would do it. Jim Lundy sitting over here oh. is tackling the project of 1,297 wolves in there. Now the 1,297 wolves takes you through the 25th anniversary. But right now we are working on the 30th anniversary book. Leo and I have started it. And uh, that actually has to be done in just one year from right now to make the 30th anniversary of uh, January 20th, 25th. Yeah, right. So look for it. It's coming. And you're welcome to study <laughs> if you want it. You can read it. If you can read it. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Leo. And I appreciate Jim bringing that detail about the sculptures being done in what was then the new track museum because I didn't have a studio big enough <laughs> at that time. And one of his tracking buddies who I had a connection with back east apparently, Jim Bruchak, was visiting and as I was finishing 42, we didn't get to overlap and say hello. So what did he do? He pulled some of the hair off of some of Jim's track and leg samples, squeezed some of my clay into a very characteristic canine uh, calling card and put the hair on there. <laughs> that was his hello. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> a card would have been nice, but <laughs> at any rate. Well, um, anybody here, anybody from around the world who knows Yellowstone Wolves or the story of Yellowstone Wolves invariably have crossed the trail of this man's work. Bob Landis' work has, since the beginning, told a lot of these stories in a way that no one else can. I had the pleasure of working with a BBC film crew, schlepping gear and helping out a few years ago, and I sat for hours. We were waiting for otters that never came. And so we just kibitzed about anything. And the one thing that stuck with me out of that conversation was, everyone respects the bull. <laughs> bull Dennis is out there all the time. He's, he's, you're thick and thin, you've got to respect the bulb. <laughs> and he has caught footage that just still drops my jaw. I don't know if you remember the day you caught the footage of the, the eagle grabbing the meat out of the coyote's mouth that showed up in the Valley of the Wolves. And everywhere else. Everywhere else. I was standing behind Bob at that point, and he turns to me and says, What the heck just happened there? They just took it out of its mouth! <laughs> the dedication and the time that goes into being able to capture those things, I can scarcely imagine the things you've missed, but we won't talk about that. Bob was willing to put together some of his unpublished uh, 42 footage. Maybe, is all this unpublished or is some of this? No, some of it's been used. Uh, there's the 21 Acceptance was used by sure. National Geographic, at least in two different films. The first one and also the uh, Wolf Pack. Yeah. Well, I'll turn it over to Bob. All Thanks, right, Bob. Well, thank you, George. Boy, I've got a couple of comments there. Uh, one is, uh, in my teaching days, I used to do a lot of field trips because I couldn't stand to be in the classroom. So we'd go out and measure stuff. I taught math, measure stuff, uh, do uh, surveying, and so on. But we could have a field trip down to C21. We could traipse over to the house. It's only about three blocks away from here. And uh, you can see that foot coming up. And George, do you still have the the 21 track that we can actually test to see whether this is not just the story. <laughs> We'd have to ask Jim. He's, he's got the, the master copy. Got yeah, lots of them for sale. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We can sell a few more. It seems like we've done pretty well on books. And uh, 
So I'm not near the storyteller without footage, quite frankly. And I did put a few things together on 42. I didn't think I had much. For one thing, I was shooting for Geographic on the special in 98, 99, and then again on a second film in 2000. And they owned all the rights to that footage. They did give me the rights to use the 21 acceptance in my own films, but the other footage uh, is somewhere in a vault in, in DC and not in my own vault. But I found a few shots uh, after that, up in Tour of Death, which it describes so well. And uh, so we'll see. And if you want to pull more of those curtains, uh, that might be a good idea. By the way, when I saw this monitor yesterday, when I tested to see whether this was going to work or not, I think I'm going to borrow that. We were talking about loaning the 21. Maybe there's a trade there, or right? loan 21. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty piece, pretty good piece. Anyway, all right. So we'll start out with the 21 acceptance. I hope. That. You have to remember, this is 97, so for one thing, I'm shooting in film, and film is not near as sharp as what we have now in HD. But a bigger problem was that I had only two magazines. Each magazine is about 11 minutes, and this went on for two hours. So normally I would like, love to have just let the camera run on a lot of it, because it was so uh, dramatic the interaction between the uh, 21 and the rest of the pack. But I couldn't, I had to husband the film, and in the end, when they were still going on this at about two in the afternoon, the batteries all quit. So uh, you'll have to refer to the Wolf Project notes, which uh, were taken, Doug may still had. But what's happening here, and, and this had never been observed as far as I know, and he's never filmed, is that this black male wolf was trying to apparently join up with all these females, of which there were three, I believe. Hey, Bob, can it's you move your cross. cursor off? Move the cursor off and that oh, little yeah, thing will disappear. That. Thank you. You don't need to see that. So that's 40. This, of course, is 21. Notice how chunky he is. I've often accused George of blowing up 21 in the sculpture. And, uh, Apparently he was that size after all, so he had a lot of hair. And this is our hero, 42. She was one of the first, after the pups, to approach this new pup, new wolf. And as, as a sidelight, I sent the footage, of course, to Geographic to have them process and look at. And the executive producer came back and said, well, what was all that craziness about, that chasing? And I told him, I said, that's the most important sequence in the film. He had no idea what the meaning of it was, and when I explained it to him, then of course they built the film around this particular sequence. <laughs> so, this is a, Doug has often quoted this particular shot where the, where 21 puts his arm around 42. And the, uh, the howling was constant. This isn't, of course, the real howling. It's all dubbed in. But the pups were howling, uh, 21 howled. I'm, not sh I'm sure the rest of the uh, females howled as well. And the only reason I got this at this sequence is that I was up the road at, at Round Prairie when I got a call on the radio saying, we've got this chasing going on down here at the confluence. You may want to come down. And I'd been filming 39, the, the alpha female at that time. And uh, she was also howling just up above the confluence. This is 40. Uh, I think the geographic dubbed her as the Iron Lady. They often did that, you know, <laughs> either that or nature, when they uh, called 302 the Cas Casanova. Uh, but anyway. <coughs> So it was, it was kind of a testing game, I think. Most of the time, they're testing to see whether 21 is, is, has enough uh, material, uh, ability to become an alpha. At the same time that this was taken, I believe that 38, the alpha male, was dying about 10 miles away, just outside the park where it had been shot. So 
So eventually all the pups that were there, I Rick would know better than I how many pups there were, but they all uh, joined up and that was the beginning of kind of a, so this is 42, uh, this is 40, and these will be the main characters then for the Druid Pack for the next, what, two, three years, four years? So I'm not sure who these two wolves are. I, I would hope that 42 is in there since this is supposed to be 42 clips, but there's a, a couple of wolves chasing near Amethyst Creek. Uh, in the days when we had a lot of elk coming through the Lamar Valley during the spring. The chase occurred, probably that's maybe a half a mile. Or pack, uh, the, the herd split. Uh, one dropped out back quite unexplainably. I just got tired of being chased. Well, that was not the right decision to make. <laughs> I did film a chase this, this fall of, uh, it was the Wapiti Pack over in Hayden, and that was the first wolf chase that I had gotten of a herd in probably 10 years. This just shows the difference between the situations we had back then that, that we have now. So this is, again, the Iron Lady 40. She picked on 42 a lot, and, and Rick didn't go into that in great detail, but. Sometimes uh, 42 would be actually bloodied by her sister. And again, maybe that was part of the contributing factor of why 40 got killed. But it happened uh, early one morning in May in the snowstorm. One of the squalls that had come through. And just as Rick described, she was laying by a culvert. My nephew, who comes in from Washington, claims he was the first one to find this animal and was very miffed when Geographic gave the credit to the Park Service finding the, the wolf. There <laughs> wasn't much we could do about it then. And if you'll notice, some key characters are here. Uh, this is Kerry Mur Murphy, testing to see whether the animal is still alive or not. Of course, didn't want to get with the famous salmon net operation. Uh, Rick? And Nathan, I believe, is here. Yep, yep, there's Nathan. And just as he described it, they put it into the, it wasn't a king cab, though, as we can see there. It was in the front seat with the driver. Uh, at that point, we still didn't, weren't sure it was 40. We, th I think, and we thought maybe 42. And then the, the, then the, the, the going off to, to the den that was across from the Buffalo Ranch and bringing these pups back to the main den. 42 had this different coloration in the summer. She was sometimes very hard to identify. In the winter, there's no problem. She was a charcoal gray. But back across the Lamar River, across Soda Butte Creek, to the Druid Den site. <coughs> and of course, this was then the beginning of this tremendously large pack. It took one more denning season to get the pack up to 37. I believe this was the year before. So this pack at this point was at 24. And uh, it was really the first pack of any size. Rose Creek was close to that size. But that was also the beginning of three other packs. And so our large pack was kind of divvied up and became much smaller. Uh, this is one of the clips I found just looking through the footage of 42 approaching a kill. And here you can see how she's changed in color from being almost jet black to a charcoal color. Uh, so my life really increased when the Black Wolf showed up in 2002, the famous 302. Get these chases during the middle of the day occasionally, which is really nice for filming because most of the time the wolves are fairly sedentary during the middle of the day. Uh, here she shows that yes, she is the alpha female. And this chase occurred at Confluence, I believe it was 2000, pardon me, 2003. But the most
most important probably interaction with 302 occurred just outside of the Buffalo Ranch over down by the river. Uh, there happened to be a nice sunrise that morning, or at least it's edited that way. And uh, so here's the, the Druid Pack on the move. I believe that down here just above the writing is, is 302 kind of watching and keeping an eye on. It was an interesting situation because 21, of course, was interested in keeping 302 away. I think it would be a challenge to his leadership. But 42 seemed to be more interested in chastising her offspring or female offspring from even consulting with 302. Uh, here they're bird dogging, now 302, uh, they're smelling his track. Again, there's a chunky 21. And you have to remember that these chases went on for, what, almost a year, at least in the winter. Uh, and later on, it was 302 that got chased because it was then the beta male of the pack. I believe we had 42 there, just ahead of 21. So they're going off to the left looking for 302, who was uh, doing the same thing basically that he did when he was, when 21 was accepted into the pack, and that is standing very still. It's the black one here to the right, typical uh, ears pointed up, letting the uh, females approach him, young ones. And of course, all the females are interested in a male because <laughs> you never know and you can go off and form your own territory. So, in other words, it's not an aggressive situation because it's an intruding male, it's good for them. Uh, they did pick on one of the females, I think it was the one we called U Black, right here. So that's a sister on a sister. 42 is a little slower in this situation, but eventually she comes in from the left. Here they made a perfunctory chase of 302 right there, the black that's out there to the left. But most of the interest was on those females that had consorted with 21. 302 goes off. 42, again charcoal gray, comes in on the run. And I don't reckon you identify, it's hard to tell because uh, the one that 42 picks on is on the ground. But I think it's either you black or half black. Both daughters of, well, we don't know. Were they daughters of 42? We don't know, do we? Because it was part of that mass of pups that year. There. So there's one more chase here. This is a chase. Well, we are got to get 302 being chased away to end the sequence. So he uh, takes off to the west, I think, probably ended up going back to his home territory, which was there on the Blacktail Plateau, a trip that he occasionally did on a daily basis to come down and visit the Druid Pack. Uh, but this is now a different male. Well, sorry, I haven't only narrated this once, and you're hearing it. <laughs> It'll be the last time, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, four oh two, uh, excuse me, forty two. So they're still on the war path with 302. This all happened on the same day. And, and some of it happened within yards of the road, and some of it happened within whatever it is down to those cotton was four or five hundred yards. Uh, so I believe that's 353 that 21 is chastising. That was the beta male at the time, and a little lip. Quite a story that, uh, again, that 
can be told about that situation. Oh, I think you mean 253? Is it 253? Yeah. What did I say, 353? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I knew yeah. I was going to get <laughs> corrected. You got something else, Rick? Well, just to add a couple of quick things. Yeah. Um, 32 was 21's nephew due to being born to 21's sister, female 7 in um, the Leopold pack. Uh -huh. And then genetically, um, the following spring from your pictures here, um, we know that um, some of the pups um, were sired by 302, but raised by their grandfather, 21. So that's part of the story, too. That's, yeah, what a story, too, isn't it? This, so this, I, you told me this the other day that, that 21 made it 42 the day that 40, the, the day before 42 died. I think that's right. Yeah, so I put it in as if that was the situation. But yes, that's right. Yeah, this is uh, 356. 356. They're going once. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's 356. It was out a carcass near the road. Uh, again, the cottonwoods in the background. Uh, again, I get them out there in front of the Buffalo Ranch. And it started to consort with the females. I don't know where 302 was this particular day, but you can see 21 and, and 42 on the attack here as they see that their daughters are mixing in with this male. The, the, the daughters left the male. Of course, they're perfectly safe here because they're part of the pack. But the wolf that's out here in the front is an intruding wolf that again gets the same treatment that 302 got. The difference between this one and the other chases that, that I remember, because uh, I looked at, just looked at the footage, was that uh, 42 here was leading the charge on the male. 21 is huffing and puffing in the rear end there, as <laughs> typical of most older males. Uh, that, that'd be a lesson, huh? But it, 42 almost catches this other male and then they disappeared behind a little knoll. And then somewhere, either January 31st or February 1st, we're still not sure, uh, 42 dies up on specimen killed by the Mollies. The Mollies had been there the day before, so we knew that that was the situation. And this is now the Druid Pack, Sans 42, looking for 42. Uh, tracking her by smell, possibly. They stopped and howled. They came through Slough Creek. And of course, never found her. So I had one shot of, of 42 howling up on the bluff. That's at Canyon East. And uh, so I put that in here at the end. And on cue, well, not quite synced up, but You know, it, Bob's winding down there of, of 42's last days. The sculpture, I'll give you just the back story a bit before I invite you to go out with me and take the, the cover off, or um, not the last time, but you, know, you get the idea. <laughs> a lot of us who knew these animals don't know them in the way that we know other people, but there's enough crossover that they do have personality. We see in them qualities of ourselves. We see in them qualities of others we know. And even though at a distance watching these animals, you can't help but have some sort of connection form. 
And Jenny and I moved here. We came made the scene in spring of 2002. Two. Can we back here? Yeah. You always need multiple people to get the story. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that spring, 42 was our neighbor. Literally, we lived at the Buffalo Ranch. And she had den, her natal den was in the foothills of Druid Peak, right next to the ranch. She eventually moved them to the traditional den site. So right from the very beginning, we were literally neighbors. And for the next couple of years, and the years into that, and I remember that day, it was actually Valentine's Day, February 2004, being out in Little America and hearing the pack howl for her, and howl, and howl, and howl, and she was never coming back. We didn't know in that spring that that would be her last year. But I happened to be on um, the viewpoint just above the confluence. I was with a family during a Yellowstone, what was then Yellowstone Association Institute outing. And the little girl and the family, you know, we were, we were all watching across the valley, hoping in the distance to see someone coming back to the den site. When the little girl said, there's a wolf right over there. <laughs> <laughs> and we all looked in the direction she was looking, and sure enough, right along the bluff, over by where the pack would come down from the den, was not just any wolf. It was 42. And she was that beautiful, ashen gray color. And she came out to the edge of the bluff, and she stopped, and she looked back. Those of you who know that look know what there's somebody else behind her and out of the trees came four or five i can't remember exactly how many at that time that year tiny little pups this big gambling out of the trees probably their first trip away from the den this was the day this was the one day of the year where they moved the pups from the den site to cease being the center of the world and out into being members of the broader world. They're moving to the rendezvous site. But they had a couple big obstacles to cross. They had the road. They had Soda Butte Creek. And of course, the main obstacle was Lamar River. And Rick and several of the other rangers stopped traffic as she was surveying the scene. And that's where the, the, the title of the piece comes from, Valley Vigil. She sort of took stock of the scene, and with those puppies at her heels, whatever the signal was she gave, they knew to follow her. And down the bluff they went, and as they hit the pavement, it was obvious to me right, that these puppies had never had their feet on hot pavement before. Because <laughs> even though it was, it was morning in July, it was still warm, and they're picking their feet up as they're crossing the pavement, and Mom is right on ahead, crosses the road, no traffic interfered, they made it through the first big obstacle. Then they hit Soda Butte Creek, and 42, along with two of her adult daughters, gathered the pups at the edge of the typical fort. Now, those of you who spend time here know July is still high water time, so it's dicey. She brings them to the crossing spot and then walks off across the creek. The puppies look at this, and completely turn the opposite direction and walk upstream. <laughs> you can almost see it on 42 and the, their, their adult daughter's face. They're like, all right, here we go. Back across the creek they went. They went, gathered up the puppies, brought them back. This is where we're going to cross, OK? You ready? Everybody ready? Let's do this. Off they went. And sure enough, the pups followed this time. And they all made it except for one. They got washed downstream about 100 yards. And as this family and I are standing there in that beautiful morning sun coming in through Soda Butte Valley, that one puppy finally gets to shore, shakes off in this prismatic spray of water coming off its coat as it bedraggedly <laughs> goes back and meets up with the rest of the litter. <sighs> Number two obstacle in the back rear view mirror. Then they hit the Lamar River. Mom proceeds with the same protocol. Off across the river she goes. The pups, see ya! Off they went in the opposite direction. The adults and her went back. They gathered up the puppies, brought them back again. Okay, you ready? This is how we're gonna, this is the spot. Off the cross they go, and they turn around, and the pups go upstream again. 
She went back. This went on seven or eight times that we were watching in that span. And the neatest thing to me was every time, and this speaks to the experienced mothers in the crowd, you know how to get the kids motivated. She grabbed at least seven different objects. Sometimes they were sticks. Sometimes they were literally a rock. And she would go around to each puppy. You want this? This is really good. <laughs> you want this? If you want this, you have to follow me. And she brought them all back to the Ford again. Again, finally, they kept going around. And the little girls asked, you know, are they going to cross? I don't know. Are they going to cross? And nobody knows. And they get up around the bend and go out of view. We had no clue what was happening. We stayed and waited and waited and waited. And then one by one, on the west side of Lamar River, we saw them climbing the bluff and on their way to the rendezvous site. <laughs> that would be her last litter. So um, if you'll join me, we'll go into the other room and welcome 42 back. So a sculpture in the fine art world is limited as an addition and once that number is sold out, they're gone. There will be no more. That's part of the limited value of having one of those sculptures. The artist has the prerogative to do an artist proof, which is outside the edition. And historically was what the artist had done first to make sure the casting was going to be right. Well, these days the technology is all the same, and the first one's just the same as the 20th one. But we still have the artist proof. Well, when the last 42 was here, went off to her forever home, the edition was sold out. But luckily I did not give away or cast and, and sell my artist proof. That's what this is. The last of the last. But because the mold had been um, stored at a foundry that went out of business, the tail mold got lost. <laughs> So here we are, sending the, the mold pieces to the foundry who will cast the last of the 42 sculptures, and she has no tail. <laughs> the closest casting of this that I could go to a bronze and then make a new mold of the tail was 100 miles away, one direction. I made that drive twice, <laughs> out and back, because the weather, it was outside, dodging rain clouds, cold weather, wind, and as I was pulling the mold apart to send it to the foundry, it broke to pieces. Oh. And the rubber, there's two, two layers. The inside rubber <coughs> holds the details, the plaster on the outside holds the shape. The plaster broke, the rubber ripped. This was the only casting I was going to get from this. So I literally and <laughs> meticulously sat in the studio for the following week and pieced together all the plaster chunks epoxied them together, and then with a needle and thread, sewed the ripped rubber portion of the mold back together, which I'm wishing that I left the Frankenstein line and the wax <laughs> to stay on the bronze forever, but I didn't. But you'll know the story. So without further ado, welcome home, 42. Thank you to 06 Legacy. Thank you to Yellowstone Forever for being the repository for our 42 on into the future. To tell her story, to convey that story. But please, all of you, tell your 42 stories. Tell your wolf stories from Yellowstone. This is one that has to carry forward. Thank you very much. I'll add one final note that I forgot. This is life size. Doug and the, the Wolf Project team loaned me the actual measurements of 42 from the time she was captured. And by the time the sculpture came into being, she had passed, of course, and I examined and measured her skull at the Heritage Center. So the facial features are the equivalent of a forensic reconstruction of 42's actual 
features. So that's just how tall she would have been if she stood on a rock next to you. So. Thanks.